ask this all in your name. Amen. Well, hello. I am BJ. I'm the sound guy. My voice is too loud because my soundboard's down there, <laughs> so I can't get to it. So I'll just hold the mic out here. Um, but my name is BJ. I'm one of the staff pastors here, um, usually in charge of youth, which is why I was here. For those of you who were here like, late last night shooting Nerf darts at people, it was a good time. Um, officially, officially, Mike has not been shot yet, so that was, a, <laughs> that, that was, uh, that was the, the goal last night, and it has not happened, so the bounty is still out there. Any kid who shoots Mike at any point today while I'm here, before I go on vacation, I will buy you a chocolate bar of your choice. That's it. <laughs> oh. Well, <laughs> before Mike comes up, and um, preaches this morning. I'm going to read some scripture over us to set the tone for, um, for our service today. So uh, it'll be on the board. You can follow along or listen along um, as we read this. This is from the Gospel of John, chapter 6. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, so they sat down. The men numbered 5,000 Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign he had done, they said, this truly is the prophet who is to come into this world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. This is God's word. Good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm here even though I wish I wasn't now that BJ just put that bounty on my head. I was thinking to myself as you were saying that, this could be the first time a pastor during a sermon gets shot (laughs) by a Nerf gun and was like approved in doing so. So I blame you for whatever happens next. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) And you're going to find some yummy surprises in your office when you get back. If you would turn with me this morning, church, to John chapter 6, that same chapter that was just read from, uh, if you could find verse 22. As you're turning to John chapter 6, there's Bibles in the pews in front of you. Feel free to use an app, but only for your Bible. I'm not going to come police and make sure that you're not texting all your friends. They should be here anyway. (laughs) No, but um, at the end of that text, something interesting was said. Um, Jesus, when they came to forcibly make him king, because it wasn't his time, he withdrew to the mountain to do what? He did what? (laughs) I heard a couple answers. He withdrew to the mountain to pray. He goes into the mountain, he prays, and one of the other gospel accounts says that he's there praying late into the night while he sends the disciples across the Sea of Galilee, and this is the incident that we would know as Jesus um, walking on water that happens next. John would record it as the fifth sign. So Jesus 
Before what we're going to discuss this morning, and we're actually going to skip over the walking on water, I wanted you to have the context of what happens prior in John chapter 6, because the feeding of the 5,000 is going to be the subject matter that begins what the people are looking for uh, as we continue on in John chapter 6 this morning. Jesus withdraws into the mountain to pray, and I just want to I want to encourage you guys, this wasn't planned. Um, I was invited this morning to a prayer meeting in my church. Not something that I led. I was invited this morning to come here at 6 a.m. and gather with a couple guys, a few, actually a few guys from our church, but a whole slew of other guys from other churches who wanted to come here to our building and pray for not only this place and for the children in the children's ministry and for the youth who gather in the youth room, but to pray for you. I was invited to that. As much as I would love to take credit for it being my idea, it was not my idea. And do you know what's awesome about that? It's how the church should work. If you have a burden to pray for the church and you're like, I really wish I could get there early and pray, then you should get here early and pray. And if you have a burden to do ministry and God's laying this on your heart, we should be joining together. All the ideas are not flowing from me down. And if you hear about a group of guys that are gathering, praying in the church, I just wanted you to know that wasn't my idea, and I think that's awesome. Not because I don't see the value. I was here. I wanted to pray. But because it's important that we recognize that the Holy Spirit is leading and moving all of us to participate in being functioning members of the body. What I didn't realize is as this was being read this morning, and, and I'm thinking about what we're going to talk about, and I wanted that passage read over us because it's really the context for what we're going to study, I didn't realize that the Lord gave me the opportunity to practice what I was about to preach, to get here early, to sacrifice sleep, and to spend some time in prayer over what God wanted to do. I am tired. I am weak. I don't feel able. But I think God's going to do something really significant today because of the state I'm in. I know it's awful early for me to cry. I haven't even gotten into it yet. But when I'm weak, he's strong. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, help. We together need your help. This is so significant, what we're going to study this morning. It matters so much. And God, I, 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 I'm so worried that this wouldn't be taken seriously and it would be seen as almost a throwaway Sunday. Lord, something that, that we forget and we forget the importance of, and I, I just want this to matter as much to us as it does to you. So for whatever reason, Lord, you're overwhelming my emotion right now. <laughs> I'm going to blame you. Lord, I ask that this matters. I ask that this matters to us. I know it matters to you. Make this matter to us. Be strong. God, be so, so strong. And just would you wrap your arms around your people this morning? Would you just love us? Would you draw us really close to you and show us the significance of where we are with you, Lord, and how close you want us to be? Would you show us, Lord, how often we go looking for the wrong thing and Jesus, how you are the answer for what we're looking for. Remind us in such a powerful way this morning, Jesus, that we are shaken to our core. That we rejoice because we are so loved by a God who's willing to shake us down. Get real with us. Remind us of where we ought to be and love us into that place. As John said in chapter 13, of this gospel, Jesus, having been given those whom the Father gave you, you love them to the end. 
you have made us the same promise that you will love us to the end, and that is on into eternity. So draw us near this morning and help us to understand. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. <sighs> well, I'm done. John chapter 6 is a powerful passage. I mean, the scriptures are just powerful every time we look at them. But John chapter 6, something really significant happens following the feeding of the 5,000. And as we get ready to pick up there, I just I have to share this at the beginning to kind of explain where I'm going. Um, I am so very thankful for our leadership team here at the church. Uh, for those of you who are coming to our DNA meeting after service at noon, it's going to happen right after service. You get to meet the whole team. Um, they're all going to be up here with me. And um, our leadership is the same group of people who stepped out to plant Transform four and a half years ago. We didn't lose any. In fact, we've added to our number, which is really cool. Um, our leadership team is the same faithful group of people, and um, their fellowship, their guidance, and their faithfulness have been some of the greatest joys of my life to experience and to share um, in leadership with them. This church wouldn't be here uh, if it wasn't for their labor on behalf of Christ. And if you know any of them, you know what I'm talking about. They are faithful people, and I'm so thankful for them. We began as a team to discuss um, in our leadership meetings communion a few months ago. And as we talked about communion, um, I realized that as I started to just kind of think more about it and discuss it with them that a lot of what I do is based off of my church tradition. I know many of us have church traditions that we came from and we're here now. Um, my church tradition and upbringing would have communion as part of their liturgy on the first Sunday of the month. That's just how I grew up. First Sunday of the month, we knew that was going to be the, the time that we took communion together. And because this was my tradition, it was natural for me to simply just bring that into the ministry that God had called me uh, to begin with this group of people. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having the first Sunday of the month be the, the, the Sunday that you take communion together. And that, if that's your rhythm, that's fine. It is a problem, however, if we're doing it just for the sake of tradition. If I'm merely doing it because that's how it's always been, not because that's what is true and what my conviction is, then I actually need to reassess that. As we discussed over the months following the initial question of why we take communion the way that we do, the Lord began to press upon me to examine the why more. Why? Why do we do it this way? Why do we take communion the way that we take it? And why do we do it with the frequency that we take it? Um, the way we participate at the table of Christ became part of several factors that I began to pray, study, and seek clarity on. Now, I want to clearly state that I don't believe that the frequency of communion is a right or wrong issue across the board for the church today. I think there are wrong ways to take it, but I don't think that your frequency and, and the necessarily the way that we have done it has been wrong. And I wouldn't condemn any church for having a different flow of how they do it. There's not a clear-cut way in the New Testament for us to know just how often the church was expected to come to the table nor is there a condemnation for those who are frequent or infrequent. There's much to be gained from the simplicity of Christ's words recorded in 1 Corinthians 11 by the Apostle Paul where he says, For the bread, do this in remembrance, and for the cup, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of him. It's pretty open-ended. And so through prayer and conversation and study, we agreed as a leadership team that we would like to make communion a more frequent part of our gatherings here. We want to partake in communion more often. So beginning this morning, we're going to take communion every Sunday as a part of our worship. It's going to be a weekly occurrence. I, that blesses me. I'm, I'm excited that you guys are excited about it. That blesses me because it's something that I think we should celebrate, we should be excited about. But something weighed on my heart and on my mind as we discussed this. We've known this for some time, that this is the direction we wanted to go. And while we were teaching through the Gospel of Mark... And if this is your first Sunday, we teach verse by verse through um, passages through the entire uh, book that we're studying in. We go line upon line because we don't want to miss anything. We like to stay in context with the Word of God. Um, I didn't want to take a break in the teachings through Mark. 
or through the Advent season or any of the seasons that have come and gone to talk about communion, but we have this little Sunday here before we begin our new sermon series next week on Ruth, um, which will begin next week. I wanted to take this break and actually spend a Sunday morning talking about what communion means, what we learn from Scripture about communion. I wanted to go deeper into the Word together, and I, I think that it just hit me. I'm not comfortable just making a change and not explaining it and not talking to you guys about why we're making the change. It would have been easy enough to just slip it in there and start doing communion every Sunday and be like, wow, we are taking communion a lot lately and just leave you in the dark about I don't want to do that. I want to communicate why we're doing what we're doing. And we felt strongly that we ought to take time to study as a church, go to the Word of God, and seek a deeper understanding of the Lord's table together. And, and honestly, I could spend a month on this. I'm not going to. I'm hoping to keep this down to about four hours today. So, <laughs> it's nice to know everyone's awake because you laughed. Okay, good. You're awake. I'm really excited about looking at this city, you guys, so I'm going to do this from two different texts. We're going to look at a big chunk of Scripture from John chapter 6. We're going to break down some parts of that, and then we'll turn to Luke 22. But let's begin here in John 6. We're going to kind of pick up after Jesus walks on water. Um, and pick up the next day after Jesus had fed the 5,000. So I had BJ read that passage from the beginning of the chapter. Let's pick up in verse 22 of John chapter 6. It's going to be a long section, so I encourage you to have your Bible out. Unless you like listening to me read aloud, then you can just close your eyes and listen away. Beginning in verse 22 of John 6, it says this. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw there had been only one boat. And they also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, you are, not, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. What sign then are you going to do so that we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said, sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me, yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Therefore the Jews started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. And they were saying, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
At that, the Jews argued among themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day, because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate, and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. No, I'm not going to break this down line for line. That would be a lot. And I see your concerned faces. But there's some primary concepts I want us to understand because, yes, this does pertain to communion. This does connect to what Jesus will teach in the upper room. So I want to point out some primary concepts that we need to understand and apply from this passage for our focus of study. The first is this. While the people sought another physical meal, Jesus offers eternal food. It's concept number one. Jesus offers eternal food. Look at verse 27. Don't work for the food that perishes, but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because God the Father has set his seal of approval on him. The food that Jesus offers to us, to those who believe, is eternal life. It's eternal food. Don't make the temporal thing the most important thing. I cannot send that point home hard enough. These people are looking for Jesus. Why? They smell a meal ticket. He just fed 5,000 men, most likely many more, but we know 5,000 men with just a few loaves of bread and a couple fish. What else could he do? Well, see, they're not thinking about what else else. They're thinking about the next meal. They're thinking about the temporal, the, the, the temporary, the thing that they need in that moment. And Jesus says it to them straight out. He says, you're not looking for me because of the sign. You're hungry again, right? Don't make the temporal thing the most important thing. The Father knows you need food and drink, but don't live your life in search of these things. Instead, Jesus teaches us in Matthew six thirty three: seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then what? All these things will be added to you. All of your wants? No. All of your needs. All the things that you need will be added to you. He will provide for you. But you must seek first the kingdom. You have to seek after Jesus. We can't make the temporal thing the most important thing. Jesus did feed these people physically, but that was not the most important bread for them to consume. It was not the most important thing. It wasn't the thing they needed most. And so the first primary concept is Jesus offers us eternal food. Here's the second. Jesus calls for belief in himself. He calls the people to believe in him. Look at verse 29. Jesus replied, this is the work of God that you believe in the one he has sent. Think about how often we're like, God, what am I supposed to do? And God says, why don't you just exist? Right? I mean, it's been said before, and it's a touch cheesy, but I'm going to say it again. We're not called human doings. We're called human. There's something to that. God calls us to believe. He calls us to exist in him, to rest. Does that mean I never do work? Of course not. I wish, but I have to. He gives me work to do, but I am not finding my identity in that work. I find my identity in who saved me from sin and death, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen? That's who we find our identity in. I don't find my identity in what I do because I'm not a human doing. I'm a human being. I know it's tacky, but it it makes the point, I think, pretty well. And so here's what we're learning here. We have to leave our desires behind, even the things that we think are very, very important, even things that we think are primary Jesus says, this is the work that God has given you to do. I want you to believe. Believe in me. Put your faith in me. And how often in our society do we get caught up in thinking that we have something to do with the provision that we've been given? 
We like to look at what we've done, and, and especially in my mindset when I'm frustrated, do you realize how hard I've worked for all this? Who puts bread on this table? He said to his kingdom. Right? Am I the king of my household? I am the steward. I feel like sometimes God's like Gandalf, like, he has not given you that authority, steward. You know, like, I'm just the steward of my, I know, Lord of the Rings fans are like, you butchered the line, but you get the point. (laughs) I am just a steward of what he has given to me. I have to leave my desires behind and be faithful to what he has given to me, what he has called me to do, and this is the work that God has called me to begin with. Believe in the one that he has sent. We are saved by grace through faith, church. Not of works. None of us can boast. The priority of our lives is no longer the fulfillment of our desires. The work that we do. Paul says, do you want wages for your work? The wages of sin is death. Chew on that for a little while. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That is salvation and it comes by grace through faith. He calls us to belief. That's the work that we set our minds to. Do we work as hard at trusting and believing and putting our hope in God as we do at whatever job we do? It's funny, I've I've had hobbies. Many of us have hobbies. I wonder if we worked it hard at believing in Jesus as we did at our hobby where we would end up. Yeah, it stings me too. And I tell you what, we need to let that calibrate us right now. Because we need to work hard at trusting in Jesus and having a deep abiding faith. For more on that, John 15. Just live in John 15. Remain in me and I will remain in you. Third primary concept from John 6, Jesus is a better provision than Moses or anyone else. I'll throw the anyone else because you're like, better provision than Moses? Oh, that was a big deal to a Jewish person. If you looked at them and said, Jesus of Nazareth is a better provision than Moses, they would be like, heresy. He made it rain manna from above. Look what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, boy, this is controversial stuff. Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. I mean, just stop right there. You ever shut off when someone's talking? Like mid-sentence, they make that statement and you don't even hear the rest because you're like, no, I can't even, I'm not going to listen to that anymore. How dare you, right? And Jesus says, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you the bread from heaven. Oh, they're freaking out. And he says, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. First of all, Moses wasn't the one who made it rain manna. Who did? God did it. So it's truthful even in the physical sense, but even more so, Jesus says, and if my Father knows how to provide that kind of manna, then when he sends you the bread of life, you better receive it. You better consume it. The bread of God, verse 33 says, is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. This isn't just a temporary meal. This is eternal life. We might be tempted to look at someone in our lives or something to provide for us, but I love how Jesus corrects their theology. It wasn't Moses that made it rain manna. It was God, and God's greatest provision for human beings was Jesus Christ himself. It is the greatest provision that God could have ever given to mankind. And building off of that concept, Jesus goes into verse 35. Take a look. It says this. This is primary concept four. Jesus himself is the bread and the cup. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry, and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. He is food and drink. He is both. Here's where we're starting to get some clarity on what communion represents. That Jesus is so much more than we give him credit for because he was our sacrifice and our atoning sacrifice. He was ransomed for our salvation, but he is also our food and our drink. Think about this, primary concept five, Jesus has to be received. Truly I tell you, verses 47 through 50 says, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the man in the wilderness, and I love how Jesus just gives it to them straight, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. We're talking about eternal life. 
just as food that's left uneaten on the table. Think about this. When Jesus says that, we get that concept, but you understand. Think about it this way. Jesus must be received. He must be received by us. If, if we have food that's left uneaten on the table, is it providing me any nutritional benefit if it's left on the table? It's pretty basic stuff, right? We tell this to our kids all the time. The broccoli doesn't belong on the table. It belongs in your face. You know, you need to eat it because that's where you need the vitamins, right? And Sarah still feeds me my broccoli just like that. <laughs> you guys, recognition of who Jesus is is not the same as consuming. It's not the same as ingesting, taking him in, receiving him. It is not enough that we say Jesus is Lord, but we do not consume the Savior. We don't take him in, we don't receive him, we don't make him Lord over our life. Jesus must be received. He must be the Lord of our lives for healing and peace to come. Otherwise, you are going to be looking for that spiritual meal everywhere. And that's what the world is doing today. Just picture the world and all that they are looking for. Maybe even us when we're in our flesh. All the satisfaction that we're looking for is just spiritual hunger. It's like the spiritual hunger games. But it's spiritual hunger thought about that one for a second. I was like, eh, maybe. I don't know. I have to break that one down a little bit more. I'll get back to you on that theological statement. I'll get back to you on it. But here, here's what you need to understand. That is just spiritual hunger. They're looking to satisfy themselves with something that cannot satisfy. Jesus must be consumed. He says, remain in me and I in you. How intimate does that sound to you? Is that your relationship with Jesus? Do we receive him and do we not only receive him, but the sixth thing that I want to point out in this passage is in verse 51. Do we receive him as our sustenance? Is he the one that satisfies? Verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus Christ himself is the sustenance he sustains the church. He not only feeds us, he satisfies us. When we are living in Christ and feasting on his word and allowing him to minister to us, if we are ingesting him, he satisfies. If we have lack of peace, we're eating the wrong meal. If we have a lack of peace in our hearts with the Lord, we need to consume the Son of God. Maybe we're trying to fill that hunger with something else. Maybe we're eating the wrong food. He is our source. He sustains us, church. Jesus goes on to say in verses 54 and 55, that controversial statement, the one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Those are hard things to hear. They were clearly struggling with it, as Jesus said this. But we need to understand this. Flesh and blood, okay? If you, if you dial back a little bit and you just think about what he's talking about, and you're like, okay, how do I understand this in a spiritual sense when he's talking about consuming my flesh, drinking my blood? The term flesh and blood is a Hebrew idiom. It refers to the total person. So if you use that idiom, you're saying that like flesh and blood means I'm referring to all of what you are. That's a holistic description of who you are, flesh and blood, okay? Now, nowhere is Jesus teaching more shocking than here. Eternal life comes from eating his flesh and drinking his blood in this sense that by believing in him, you consume him. You are taking him inside of yourself. In other words, you need to receive Jesus as your whole Savior, as the only sustainer of who you are, as your only opportunity, basically the way, the truth, and the life. No one's going to come to the Father except through him. Mentality. That's what Jesus is saying. I am everything that you need. By believing in him, 
we are taking in that flesh, we are drinking that sacrificial offering. The proof of, his, of this is his preceding statements in verses 29 and 47 about believing in him. He sets people up to think that way. He sets the whole thing up by saying, this is talking about belief. You need to believe in me. And he makes that shocking statement about flesh and blood, and they immediately go physical. What? I don't understand. He's like, I'm teaching you about belief. Why are you disconnecting the two? It's still the same subject. Understanding this passage of Scripture is so important, I believe, in understanding a deeper significance of communion. Because I believe that's what Jesus is talking about here, based off the terms and the subject matter of where he goes on the night that he was betrayed. This passage clarifies why the institution of communion by Jesus is so significant and special for the church throughout history. It's not just a wafer of bread or a tiny cup of juice or wine. It is remembrance and recognition of what Jesus, of who he is, of what he did, what he means to us. It's a remembrance of his provision spiritually by offering his physical body, and remembrance means so much more than mental recollection. It's so much more than just remembering, oh yeah, Jesus died for me. Most of us haven't forgotten, if any. So when he's talking about remembrance, as we're going to talk about in a moment, what's Jesus getting at when he says remembrance? Let's look at the communion meal given by Jesus on the night he would be betrayed. Turn with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, verse 14 They're in the upper room. They've already eaten dinner. Jesus is instituting something new. This is a new part. It says this in verse 14, When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Verse 19, he took bread, he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, the cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And I I love including verse 23 in this. So they began to argue among themselves which of them it could be who was going to do it. And we know they went one by one, saying, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? That's very us, isn't it? In the Jewish world, remembrance This is what uh, Paul Bradshaw said. I love this quote. In the Jewish world, remembrance was not a purely mental activity. It was not simply about nostalgia for the past, but about asking God to remember his people and complete his saving purpose today. It's very important to understand because it's not just about mentally recollecting what happened. It's not about remembering in the sense of, I have forgotten this truth. What it's about is, is asking God to remember his people and complete his saving purpose today. Takes us a little bit deeper into communion, doesn't it? When we share communion, we're asking God to complete his saving purpose in us today. We're asking for his power to be at work in us. Let's go a little bit deeper. If we're talking about recalling a past event so that the power of that event can enter the present, Communion recalls the past, asking that the power of Christ be at work, and it also does something else then if we look at the text. It's not just for now. It's not just for this moment. Think about what it says in verses 16 through 18. Jesus said, For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. What is Jesus saying? Does he say, I really hope that I get to have this meal again with you guys later? Is that what he said? What does he say? I'm not going to do this again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. That's a statement of truth and fact. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross and he's already declared victory. He's already saying, we will share this again someday. It's an absolute. He says it again in verse 18. I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Jesus said, this is done. He will be victorious. The eating and drinking together, as you think about this, um, with that context in mind of thinking not only present power and present remembrance, but also future anticipation, there's a little bit of parousia there, meaning that we're thinking about his second coming, but also think about the significance that this draws in from the past as well. The eating and drinking together has the significance of a covenant meal in which the two parties had fellowship and pledged their loyalty to each other. You can read about it in Genesis and in Exodus. The new covenant between the Lord and his people, according to Jeremiah 31, was ratified by our Savior in the communal meal before his death by saying, I'm bringing all of this together in me. That's why the teaching of John chapter 6 is so important. He is the bread of life. He is the drink. It is Jesus, and we are calling for his power to be present amongst us, saying he has been faithful not only through all of the histories of the ages, but he will continue to be faithful all the way into the new kingdom where we sit at the table and we share this meal with him and we raise a glass to the king of glory. That is going to happen, church. We are going to celebrate with him his victory. That is going to be one awesome meal. An institution of the communion supper, Jesus emphasized the messianic and eschatological aspects of the Passover. He used all the history of the Old Testament and brought it into that moment, and he points forward to all of its fulfillment in him. At this feast, Jesus looked forward to another deliverance like that from Egypt, Only now it's the Messiah who has come in person to this Paschal feast, taking the cup of judgment and salvation, which means deliverance for God's people. Yet the meal also anticipates the final messianic banquet when the divine work of salvation is consummated and there's a fulfillment of fellowship with the Lord for all eternity. You guys, baptism is just like this. The supper is is thus an enacted preaching of the gospel. It's an enacted preaching of the gospel. It's a visible word. If we think of communion as a visible word, we are practically doing something that's declaring the good news of the gospel. It's not just sitting and listening and hearing and, and, then, and then writing our notes down, maybe drawing a little thing over here. But like, it's, if I, try, I find the little comment cards with all the kids' doodles on them. Um, It's it's not just sitting and listening to the word taught and reading the word and praying and singing. If we have the opportunity to take communion together, we are partaking in a visible declaration of the gospel. It's a visible declaration of what he has done, what he does in this moment here, and what he will do in the future. It brings together all of the ages and the consummation of Christ over history. Its specific function is to stress the historicity of what took place, its present relevance, and its future fulfillment. And in the Lord's Supper, the stress falls on the continuing significance of what was done once by Jesus on the cross and upon abiding fellowship and unity amongst the body. Please don't miss that. This is a unifying meal. This is a unifying thing. I want you to think about what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, verses 16 and 17. He says this, The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, since all of us share the one bread. Communion is intended to be a unifying meal. Something that we recognize is we who are many are now made one in Christ. 
It's a reminder. He's speaking of this unifying work of the Spirit amongst the body and unto the Spirit. We ask that he would be at work and powerfully present within us by believing in and entrusting our lives in Christ. We're asking the Holy Spirit to be at work within us and to unify us and to empower us to the purpose and to give us the ability to walk in a way that Jesus walked. Remember what Jesus said in John 6, eternal life comes from eating his flesh and drinking his blood, that is from believing in him. The great importance attached to taking and receiving has produced an urge within our church to not be too infrequent in doing so. In fact, I believe that I don't want to miss that opportunity anymore. I want to take communion with you as often as I can because I believe its significance is far greater than I have valued it. You know, in the, the church in ages past, do you know it was the central focus of the speaking place where the pastor would preach? Do you know it was in the middle of the stage that took on the dominating position in history? It was the bread and the cup. If you do a little bit of research and you go back into history, the bread and the cup was often the centerpiece of church gatherings. I'm not going to put the bread and cup right here because I'll trip over it and just embarrass myself. But I think that bringing it into a more visible and important aspect of what we do is needed. For many Protestant churches, Infrequent communion has become a part of their gathering in contrast to the regular administration of the early church. And again, I'm not saying that this is a sin issue for the church. I'm not saying it's a sin issue at all. I'm not condemning anyone's church liturgy. What I am saying is this, the frequency of taking communion is not defined clearly in the New Testament. So by teaching on this, I'm speaking to our specific church situation and I'm saying I don't want to miss this opportunity to take this meal with you anymore. I want to take it with you on a regular basis because I want to remember Jesus together as often as we can with a visible word. I think that that's like my greatest desire is to visibly take of the gospel together as a church. Taking communion is no guarantee. However, I need to say this. Taking communion is no guarantee of genuine spiritual unity. Genuine spiritual unity happens in our hearts. Aligning ourselves with Christ, that's why he starts with belief. And then he gives them the celebration of communion as something to remember him by. But he calls us to belief first. If we want genuine spiritual unity, it's going to begin in our hearts. On the other hand, with genuine faith, there may be genuine expectation of genuine nourishment of the new life in the power of the Spirit as we take communion. I don't believe in transubstantiation. Let me just say that. And for those of you like transubstantiation, who, what he? That means that the bread becomes the actual body of Jesus. That means that the cup becomes the actual blood of Jesus. I don't agree with that. I don't believe that that's a biblical teaching. I think it's going away from what Jesus was making the point to say. But I will say this. I believe in my non my non I can't even say it right. My non-denominational upbringing, we have undervalued the bread and the cup. And I want to exalt Jesus by taking of his body and his blood. The sacrament is no mere observance with only psychological effects. By its evangelical proclamation, it can be used by the Spirit to strengthen faith, to evoke love, to promote sanctification, to confirm fellowship with the Lord and with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It can promote all of those things in the church. And that is not something that I only want to do monthly. That's something I want to experience with you as a church all the time. When the richness of its meaning is brought out in the word, and when the relevance of the word is brought home by the act of personal response, the Lord's Supper, I believe, may indeed become a means of grace. It may administer grace to our lives like we have not experienced yet because we're doing it in obedience and in honoring of the Savior. It's aligning our hearts with his much the same reason why we pray and we study his word. We're seeking to align our hearts with his. And when we come to him and say, you are my food, my drink. You are everything. You are my eternal life. All the more we're aligning our hearts with him.
And through the sacred meal, Christ's saving work is once more presented. We experience the enjoyment of his abiding and sustaining fellowship in the spirit. The communion table is then a symbol of Christ's victory. It's a symbol of his victory, and this is important. And I'm coming home, you're like, oh my gosh, is he going to keep talking? Yes! I get one Sunday to talk about communion. The table is a symbol of Christ's victory and anticipates his triumphant return. And that is very exciting. That's a very good thing. The early church used the Greek word Eucharist. When they would refer to the community, we call it communion. Some people call it Last Supper. They called it Eucharist. Do you know what the Greek word Eucharist means? Thanksgiving. People like think, oh, that's, that's like Catholic. I mean, that's, no, it's the Greek word for Thanksgiving. Do you know what's fascinating about that? Henry Nguyen wrote this. The word Eucharist means literally act of Thanksgiving. To celebrate the Eucharist and to live a Eucharistic life has everything to do with gratitude. It's gratitude towards God for what he gave us in Christ. Living Eucharistically, I love that usage of the word, is living life as a gift, a gift for which one is grateful. But gratitude is not the most obvious response to life, certainly not when we experience life as a series of losses. Still, the great mystery we celebrate in the Eucharist and live in a Eucharistic life is precisely that through mourning our losses, we come to know life as a gift. As we go through the struggles of life and we come together on Sunday morning and we share communion, we're saying, thank you, Lord, for the gift of eternal life. Thank you for this beautiful blessing of life that you've given to me. I remember that my salvation came at a cost and that you loved me so much that you died on the cross to save me of my sin and that because of belief in you, I will have eternal life with you forever. Dietrich Bonhoeffer would add this, the day of the Lord's Supper is an occasion of joy for the Christian community. Reconciled in our hearts with God and the brethren, the congregation receives the gift of the body and blood of Jesus Christ, and receiving that, it receives forgiveness, new life, and salvation. One more thing. And worship team, you can come on up, and those of you who are going to hand out communion this morning, you can come forward too. Please don't get distracted as they walk up here. One more thing. I believe that in my church tradition, again, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to put this down at all, I've shifted how I approach the communion table. Because for me, it was always a moment of mourning, despondency, grief, sorrow, and sadness. I don't approach it that way anymore. If it's convicting, so be it. But in conviction, we discover what? That as we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Hallelujah, Jesus has saved us. Coming to the table of communion is just as Bonhoeffer said, I agree with him wholeheartedly. It is an opportunity to celebrate. It is a welcoming of the church to come and recognize that our God so loved us that he sent his only son and whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's good news, guys. That's the gospel. That's a visible word. I want to ask you this. If it's a visible picture of the gospel, if communion is a visible picture of the gospel, is that how we're preaching the gospel to the world? Oh, you should really get saved. It's, you know, you're not worth it, but God loves you. I don't know why. But I'm glad he does because someday I'll understand. Right now, I don't like you very much, but you should give your life to Jesus. It's great. Love living for my Lord and Savior. It's, it's awesome. Is that how we treat the gospel? Isn't it good news? Isn't it something that should be declared and celebrated and we get excited about? We can come to communion celebrating. We can come to communion and celebrate that our Lord loves us this much. And as we prepare to take communion together this morning and every Sunday morning after this, I want you guys to do this for me. Let us do Four things. I want to call us to four things. One, let's think of the sufferings of Christ. You're like, I thought we were supposed to celebrate. It is celebratory. Think of the sufferings of Christ. Call upon the Holy Spirit to help us glorify God in the way that Christ has taught us. For we can celebrate that Jesus, through all he endured, still glorified the Father. 
to the ultimate extent. Three, let us enter into fellowship with God and each other as we unify our hearts and our minds to be imitators of Jesus. And let us celebrate, number four, that our Savior is victorious, that he has invited us to the marriage feast of the Lamb in the kingdom of God, where we will eat and drink with him in celebration of our salvation and union with him for all eternity. Amen. We can celebrate that. <laughs> Communion involves all of it. Church, I am so excited to celebrate Jesus with you with a visible word every Sunday. It's something I've longed for. My team knows this. I've been praying about this and talking to them about it for months now. And it's just been killing me because I, I didn't want to do it without sharing why. I wanted you to know why. I wanted to show you the word of God. So let's take communion together. I'm going to pray. They're going to distribute the bread and the cup. And what we're going to do is we're going to sing a song, and then I'm going to walk us through it together as a church family. So would you pray with me, and then we're going to sing and praise him while they distribute the bread and the cup. Lord, thank you so much for this church body. Uh, just seeing their faces, I just love being with these people. God, I'm still in awe as I stand here this morning, and I'm so humbled that I am privileged to be a part of this body, that I get to be a member of this church. Um, Lord, that I get to be a part of what's going on in their lives. Lord, that I get to share in the joys of them gathering in their homes to worship you and to read the word. And Lord, it is even a joy, a deep joy, when we go through trials and struggles and grief and mourning together because you work powerfully in those times. Lord, to strengthen us and to build us up and to unify us. It's amazing to see what you do in the midst of struggle because you still continue not only to get your will done, but to strengthen your church. As you told Peter, as you talked to, about, talked to him about his name, and said, I'm going to call you Peter now. And then referring to yourself, you said, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. Peter was a little stone. Jesus, you are the cornerstone of our salvation. And Jesus, as we think about that, and you speaking this powerful word, not only you are the head of the church, that is the body, you are the cornerstone upon which it is built, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Lord, we celebrate you this morning, and we worship you this morning as we take communion together. Jesus, would you just overwhelm us with your presence and unify us as your people.